Thanks for listening to Creative Control. Uh, While I have you here, please consider supporting Youth Empowerment and Support Services, otherwise known as YES. Based in Edmonton, Alberta, YES provides immediate and low-barrier overnight and day shelter, temporary supportive housing, and individualized wraparound supports for young people aged 15 to 24. They work collaboratively within a network of care focused on the prevention of youth homelessness by providing youth with the necessary supports to stabilize their housing, improve their well-being, build life skills, connect with community, and avoid re-entry into homelessness. Learn more about how to donate or otherwise support YES by visiting YESS.org. Hey, this is Trevor from Halifax calling in to say that I support Creative Control on Patreon because I think long-form arts journalism is a crucial part of music culture and there's simply not enough of it out there today. Vish is a master interviewer, he lands great guests, and he has his finger on the pulse of the ever-changing music landscape both here in Canada and abroad. For all of these reasons and many more, I think you should support Creative Control on Patreon too. To make your flexible monthly donation to Creative Control, please visit patreon.com slash creative control today. I'm Visha's wife, and I will love him no matter what you do. And now he has me on the record saying that. Andre Ette and Joseph Shabson are both talented musicians, songwriters, and producers based in Toronto, Ontario. Known for a variety of collaborative and solo pursuits over the past 25 years, Ette and Shabson have teamed up to operate in a new band called Fresh Pepper. Their self-titled debut record is out June 17, 2022, via Telephone Explosion Records, and features contributions from Destroyers Dan Behar, Bernice's Robin Dan, Felicity Williams and Tom Gill, Kieran Adams, and Bram Geelan, all of whom contribute to a meditation on restaurant work. Andre and Joseph returned to this show, this time together, and we had a fun conversation about Joseph's home studio, how they first met, how their relationship impacted the Destroyer album Kaput, the basketball dominance I now have over small children, my self-service gas station job in high school, and why Party Mix is just a low-tier restaurant buffet, how their respective experience working in restaurants led to Fresh Pepper, how music you associate with jobs changes that music, the pros and cons of being in a wedding or a cover band, the Saturday Night Live sketch Pepper Boy, Fresh Pepper's future plans, and much more. A part of the Entertainment One Network with the support of listeners like you who follow and subscribe to this podcast and spread the word about it and make flexible monthly donations at patreon.com slash creative control with additional support. From Blackbird Music, a well-stocked record store, locations in Edmonton and Calgary, Alberta, and friendly staff who will happily help you source special orders uh, for anything you like, really. If you say you want the new uh, Fresh Pepper album, go to blackbird.ca and see if they can help you out there. Plus, in-kind support from Pizza Trocadero, The Bookshelf, and Planet Bean Coffee in Guelph, Ontario, and Granddad's Donuts in Hamilton, Ontario. This is episode 693 of Creative Control, featuring the lovely and talented Andre Etche and Joseph Shabison of Fresh Pepper, with your host, me, Vish Khanna. Fresh pepper, how are you? Hello. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, is it weird? Is it is it odd to? Has anyone ever referred to you both in the same at the same time as fresh pepper, Joe? Has that ever happened? No, but I enjoy it. <laughs> the name kind of makes me laugh every time. Like I still like that we decided to do that. <laughs> <laughs> Andre, anybody? No one's ever been like, "Hey, look, it's fresh pepper walking down the street." I think you're the first, and but I'm looking forward to being referred. to 
do collectively as fresh pepper nice yeah. it's great to have you both back uh on the show uh but this time together uh i'll start with uh, joseph here joseph uh, where in the, you're both in the same room so i can see that but joseph where in the world are you guys today we are in toronto in the junction triangle on a street called edwin and we're in my studio oh very nice you have your own studio is it like attached to your house or is it a separate space it's the garage that my house came with and then a few years ago we decided to turn it into a proper studio well, who's we exactly my wife and i <laughs> oh very nice <laughs> yeah i mean <laughs> <There's> a, <laughs> i don't make decisions unilaterally in my household <laughs> you had some buy-in there yeah. you didn't just go in the garage one day okay yeah. that's good it looks nice uh, how many do you all do you often record all your stuff there yeah everything i do like we recorded this album here it's one big room but then, like, depending on how you record, you can do it in a way that works for a lot of people. So we recorded Fresh Pepper here, and there was five of us in the room, like drums, guitar, keys, all of it. And, yeah, it can work great. It sounds amazing in here. It's a beautiful, Who does the, uh, when you're space. involved in such a thing, who, who's engineering or producing? Me. Oh, no. So you're in charge of the whole kit and caboodle? Yeah, he's like yeah. spinning around in a chair. Yeah, <laughs> frantic. I mean, I'm frantic at the best of times, but yeah, it was. it's good. Once everything's set up, it's just push and play. Oh, yeah. nice. Well, it looks very cozy, I might say. Andre, uh, uh, am I right? It looks like I see uh, from it's, my vantage point, you got like nice lamps. and It's it's beautiful. Here, hold on. Let me, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to spin around the computer so you can see. Inviting technical disaster here, but okay, fine. Spin me around. Okay, hold on. So we got the back. Oh yeah. All there right, yeah, but you're away from the microphone. And it doesn't then matter. This is the other way with the tape machine and the piano. So Vish is seeing the studio. The computer. Oh wow! Look at this. Very professional. Yeah. I'm a professional. It's nice. Do you uh, do you have engineering? Uh, uh, experience per se beyond just doing everything yourself there uh, Joe's mm, no I mean I just taught myself over the years out of necessity I think like it started with just recording saxophone for people and then slowly expanding and then once I got this space I really wanted to learn how to record drums and piano which is something that always really scared me like it felt totally nebulous and impossible and hmm. yeah slowly I've just sort of taught myself stuff which is nice but you, and I, I don't mean to invite uh, thieves and scoundrels, but you look like you got some good gear there. Like that looks like highfalutin. I was expecting like a little, you know, like tape recorder. But you've got like all the good gear. That's that's amazing. That's his, his. So what you're saying is that when you see me, what you think I deserve, yeah, and what my, from your clothes, and my what, what my music sounds like, you think it's kind of just low fi garbage. I was expecting garbage. the studio to be schlubbier. <laughs> <laughs> That's really nice, Vish. I appreciate that. I but, just assumed you'd have like a Fisher Price recorder, yeah. and then all your records. I, all your records that I have are on those Fisher Price records. You know, like yeah. that's yeah. why I, yeah. I assume it was a pipeline situation, like right direct yeah. distribution or something. Yeah. Anyway, no, no, I'm kidding, of course. No, your records sound great. This all checks out for me. So, and and we're doing this. This is a recording session. We are using your gear. Right. To make this podcast. So Wait, do you hear you how good it sounds on our end? It's going to really dwarf the sound of your own voice. No, my, that's I, been a, I have, that's been actually, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's been a dream of mine for some time to kind of record it so well. well. Joseph, can you speak a little bit? Speak to which microphones we're using and some gear. <laughs> well, this is the SM7B, but it's going to be going into an LA2A compressor, which is going to make your microphone sound like the microphone of a puny. Oh, and on. what microphone am I speaking into? Because I noticed I sound great. It's an RE20. Really fantastic dynamic microphone. And this is, is what the Beatles used? I really? bought it off of John Lennon's um, estate. Did you really? Yeah, bankrupted me, yeah. I did not realize that. Well, that's amazing, Joe. I'm just, yeah. All I'm trying to say is I'm proud of you and surprised. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take it. Sure. Thank you. <laughs> Andre, uh, how many uh, uh, projects have you done in this garage beyond uh, Fresh Pepper there? Have I ever... I had been in the studio before, but did I ever record in here? No. I don't think I... I think Fresh Pepper is the only thing I've ever recorded here. We, I once recorded a live thing for... Oh, that's something. right. 
outside using the studio, but we ran the mics out into Joseph's backyard and I just played on my own and then, well, and Joseph played a little bit of saxophone with me. Okay. Well, I'm curious about this union on a couple of different levels, both uh, out of general interest and also concern. Andre, (laughs) how did you meet uh, Joseph and become friendly with him enough to collaborate on music together? I met Joseph when he was playing in a band called Jewish legend, maybe? Jewish legend, yeah. yeah, and we became friends then, and but I knew I knew him really well at that time. So we, yeah, we were so just there. happenstance meetings, like just like being at the same places. Well, no, my friend Josh ran that, or that was his band, uh, great band, and uh, and we. Uh, uh, it sucked. I'm sorry. No, it was a great <laughs> the band. band. <laughs> It was, a tra- was it was a very traumatic experience for me, which you can get into another time. But yeah, you know, why do you I- why do you suppose we would save that for another time? It seems germane now. You I'm think we're going to have a follow up session where we just talk about this, this band you don't like? News to me. I, I've only heard great things, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, it was a fraught relationship. I think I was very oh, okay. young and eager, and me and, and Josh was sort of older, and we butted heads a lot, and. I mean, I'll leave it at that, but it, I, That's fine. Yeah. In, in retrospect, I had a very bad time, but I met Andre and a bunch of wonderful people through it. Yeah, well, Joseph ended up playing on a record of mine when I was making records for the label Blue Fog mm-hmm. uh, in Toronto and went on tour with my band that Joseph was in at that time with Kieran and Chris Sands and Paulo Coyne. We went on tour with Destroyer, and that would have been a long time ago, like 2008? 2008, yeah. Oh, wow, and, okay. Uh, right, yeah. So just when Destroyer was putting out, we were they were touring on... Trouble in Dreams. Trouble in Dreams, and just before the great renaissance of Kaput, <laughs> right? And so we did that tour, American tour with them, and, and that's when uh, we, we met them. And then Joseph was going to Vancouver... I'll tell you your story, Joseph. Do it. And that, and I, and be, I'm going to personalize, make it about me, where I was like, <laughs> Joseph, you should contact Dan because they're working on a record. That never happened. Yep, it did. <laughs> I have the emails, <laughs> and did, that's not how it happened. I mean, that, I don't, and I then, don't remember. And then you, you were like, "Oh yeah, me. I should." And then, and then maybe you, you did actually. You, and then you, and then they were like, "Yeah, you should play on this record." And then that's why Joseph is, and because of uh, myself. Just to, clarify, was... so just to clarify, which <laughs> Joseph is disputing this, but what you're intimating, Andre, is that because of your suggestion that the Joseph contact Dan, Joseph became ostens- ostensibly a collaborator and destroyer. Is that what you're suggesting? Ba- essentially, the sound of Kaput and right. instrumental to the success of that record. I'll also say that Andre might be right, because in my mind, I think over the years, I changed it to me contacting Dan on my own, which I did, but I think it might have been at Andre's behest. And <laughs> I remember contacting him and saying that we should jam, which in retrospect feels like an insane thing because, I mean, Dan doesn't really do that. And it was just where my head was at at the time. But yeah, it might have been because Andre told me to do it. Right. But, but, and just but, to be clear to anyone at home that doesn't know what we're that joseph plays saxophone on the destroyer record kaput and that is a very sax heavy record yeah and but has subsequently collaborated further with destroyer and toured with destroyer right to a lesser degree (laughs) to a lesser (laughs) no no no, just joking (laughs) to a lesser extent unless andre has a direct hand in my collaboration he's not particularly interested in talking about it (laughs) right no i I no, i'm just yeah it should be it should be noted that i'm wearing a labyrinthitis destroyer shirt right now. Oh, oh really? Oh. Yeah. Is that? It's that, hard to tell because of the that's angle. That's the design they, they they went with that design. Can you pan down so we can see? Uh, fine. <laughs> Why? Oh, yeah. See. Look. Oh, oh yeah. very nice. I just had a bowl of sugary cereal, so I'm feeling a little full. But yeah, you can see. You see what was going on there? <laughs> go, go you see what's happening? <laughs> Just wanted to let you, you know. Andre, Andre, we should go. I think uh, it looks a bit too full to finish. Wait, this are you? Do you have body dysmorphia? I don't think I do exactly, but I. Why are we talking about this all of a sudden? No, I don't think so. I don't, no, I'm fine. I'm fine. I like to try to take care of myself, but I've been a bit lax on it. I played basketball with my son the other day, and we play a full court one on one. 
I mean, sorry. Wow. Full court. He's much smaller than you are, though. He is much smaller I'm, than me? Is that what you just said? Your son is. My son. I, I don't think it's fair. <laughs> no, but, but as a father, do you, both of, all of us are dads. Uh, you end up in these scenarios where your child uh, wants to develop a skill. You are uh, maybe a few light years ahead of them. But to encourage right. them, you let them feel like they have made progress. Whatever the... Well, this actually... That's true. This, this brings up a funny story that Andre told me back in 2008 when I first met him, which was that when he was younger, his dad never let him w win the race, which yeah. always stuck in my mind as being very, very funny yeah. because... He didn't let me. <laughs> I have a four-year-old, and I mean, sometimes I'll beat him and other times I'll let him win, but to never let him win is such a big flex. And <laughs> <laughs> it's a big dad Well, flex. it's a big dad flex. It is reality, though. Like, so what... Okay, I'll tell you what... Andre, you tell me what you make of this because uh, what will happen is uh, I will try very hard. Uh, I'll try my best, I should say, to uh, in basketball to... Uh, it's, mm -hmm. it's a hard thing to fake uh, being bad at basketball because you really have to be like, I'm going to take a full court shot every time I have the ball. That's the only way you can be like, oh... Wait, I'm sorry, Vish, are you implying that you're very good at basketball? I have become... And therefore it's hard to fake... I have become in, as a 44-year-old, I could finally make my high school team. Like, I don't know what's going on. I once picked up my kid in Guelph when we were living in Guelph. Uh, Levon was at a basketball camp, and I went to pick him up, and because of the time frame, we had 10 minutes to shoot around and the kids were just watching me hit threes. Cause I, I did a thing where I just did around the world. I'm not bragging mm -hmm. here. I was also mystified. Okay. I was just doing a uh, going around. I was like, okay, I hit that one. I'm just it's debatable whether or not I'm not bragging. bragging. I'm saying I'm equal. He, okay. I get there and they're, they're little kids. Right. And they're trying to hit full, like college basketball, full, like half court shots. And yeah. they're not even close. Right. So my yeah, kid goes, uh, Papa, kids. Papa, why don't you try? I hit it in two shots. I chucked it That's full good. swish. So then I'm like, okay, what's going on? To the point where I'm hitting those threes and a dad, another dad comes up to me. He's like, hey, would you play college ball? I'm like, I didn't make the high school team. I sucked. Wow. I had no motivation. I was into music and art. I didn't want to, I hated yeah. the jocks. Like I just decided that. But now I have yeah. this skill set. And he, like, the kid, he's like, Papa, why are you in the NBA? I'm like, I don't, I don't yeah. know what to tell you. Like, this is disappointing on two levels. Because one, his yeah. father can hit, shoot lights out, not in the NBA. How discouraging is, so this how is, discouraging a, is that? Not a one-off. No. This is, this, this is continued. Yes, I don't know what's going on. Like, I th oh, I do know what's going on. Uh, and you can tell me what you think of this. Because I've seen uh, bands reunite. Uh, you know, like after they they started as kids and there's tension and everyone's trying to, you know, uh, assert themselves. And then as they get older, right. they get more chill. They get a little more relaxed. Mm. And you watch them. I saw the Jesus Lizard do this where like when I used to see them, it was like you could tell. Like, and I knew like a backstory like eh, there was some friction backstage, you know, on the tour, mm -hmm. but on the on the in the van. And But mm -hmm. then you, when you see them, when they're like older, comfortable in their skins. You know, relaxed. I think the same is true of me in basketball. I got nothing to prove. You That's know what interesting. I'm... But you also, you're also saying that a more relaxed Jesus lizard is a better Jesus lizard. What I'm saying is... That that was their problem before. <laughs> One of the most aggressive... Those records were just too... <laughs> I'm saying... Too I'm... much aggression. <laughs> uh, they needed to chill out. I'm saying... I'm <laughs> David say... Yao needs to just sit down maybe while he's performing. I don't know. Yes, they needed to do more unplugged sets. That's what everyone says yeah. about the Jesus lizard. No, I'm yeah. saying that on a social level, they, yeah. they would all say it too. We play better. We play better yeah. because we're not like, there's no tension between us as people. I'm not saying there would be tension between me and my child, but I just mean. I was going to say, do you think that as he gets better and more close to your level, that maybe tension will arise like once he's able to beat you? So back to your point about whether or not to let your child win. Uh, I, okay. I, oh, yeah. I have. Is... So what will happen is I will play as best I can. And I will also say. Hey, like you're taking way too many shots out of your range. Like you're going to, why don't you move up? I'm not even guarding you. Just come up. But he, they won't listen. So I yeah. inadvert because they miss so much, I lay stuff up and I'm running up the score. And then I'm like, okay, pump the brakes now. 
let the kid come back. But then right. they get so cocky in their trash talking that I want to destroy them. Wow. Do you see where I'm coming yeah, from? Yeah. So it's it's twofold. Yes, it's the, but the last it's the Billy Madison approach. Yeah. To... <laughs> so the other day we were playing, and I was it, it was our first game of the season, if you will, and uh, the spring. I'm in Edmonton. There's rarely any you know right. pavement to see most of the year. But he was chill. I he didn't lose. They didn't lose their temper. They didn't do any of that stuff. It was totally mm-hmm. pleasant, and he he was. They were saying like, "Nice shot, Papa." That's great. Wow. Like sportsmanship was coming into it. I'm just saying yeah. I was impressed with the development. So anyway, back to you guys. I don't know why we're talking about me and the basketball, but <laughs> you said uh, I'm you said I'm into it. I, well, I'm was a good curious about your. Basketball. Well, I don't know if you have your skills. We've learned now that you're a great basketball player. Better could have been in the NBA. Now at 44, now I'm better and, than I was because I think as a teen. Yeah. There was a lot of social pressure to be on the team and you don't want to embarrass yourself in front of people. You know, there's crowds mm-hmm. of people. All I'm saying is... I think what you're saying is if the NBA was populated by... How old is your son? Uh, eleven. I want to say 11. 11-year-olds? So if it was all 11-year-olds and Vish at yes. 44, yes. you would dominate. <laughs> No, so all I'm all I'm getting at with this, by the way, it's not the one on one part; it's the shooting. So I I should clarify: it's not that I can roll children uh, at basketball. It's like I am just on my own hitting outside shots that make no sense for me to hit with that level of consistency. That's what I'm getting at. And I don't, and I wear glasses. Like I don't know what it is. I should be. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm physically. I should be diminishing physically. My accuracy should be getting. I think. Worse, what I'm saying is, right. perversely and pointlessly, I am getting better at a sport I can't possibly monetize. <laughs> when it comes to basketball, you're Benjamin Buttoning. But yes. it does well, it sounds like you're getting a lot of practice. Yeah. Well, we try. Like I said, I've gone once. All of this to say, body dysmorphia. I try to run, and that was my first. Oh, right. You're very slim. You're very slim. I, I'm fairly slim, you're but I yes, I have yeah, like a little that's... tummy, and I always, I we used to call it when I worked at the self serve gas station in high school. I used to call it the shell belly because I would eat all the junk food oh, yeah. snacks yeah and i i so. have a little tummy that's fine i don't know what to tell you i, I feel i'm not obsessed with it but yeah i'm, I'm, I'm like you know like when they say hey well, what, here's okay, wait, i got a question for you, you a gas great. station you question great. you have a you gas station great. question no matter what actually what's that andre yeah. sorry what did you say Andre? i'm just saying that you look great from the mid section up <laughs> no, i'm seeing you in I, like in a bust sort of shape <laughs> right now like I, from shoulders up and you look fantastic i run and i try to eat relatively well uh, all those things, mm-hmm. but I, I want to live. I've decided over the last couple of years. I don't know if you guys are aware of this pandemic thing, but I've just decided I like living, and I like having mm-hmm. all my faculties, and that's just something that mm-hmm. came to mind. So I, but I have been this way since just before I had started running just before regularly before my son was born. Lost twenty five mm-hmm. pounds. Uh, Good for you. Yeah. yeah, but I didn't. But when you were at that shell station, Vish, I have to ask: Did they carry party mix? Did they carry Hostess party, party mix? mix? Well, this, is, this is my question: Is are you getting the Frito Lay party mix, or are you getting the Hostess party mix, or the Humpty Dumpty rather? So, and okay, that's an interesting question. I, I was never. Are you a party mix person? Do you like the every, I love, everything at I love once? The Humpty Dumpty party mix. Really? I love. What's in What's I in the hu- party mix? I'm gonna say something right now because yeah. I've actually ta- thought about this before. I hate party mix, and I'll tell you why. It reminds me of garbage because it looks like they've swept the floor yes and they dump it in a bag yeah and then you get it it, it, it i'm gonna have to respectfully disagree so, yeah, so, so yeah, joseph yeah. you're going to a restaurant and they say uh hey you can have the buffet or you can order off the menu what's your preference well it depends oh, so. if I'm going to a buffet restaurant. No, 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 no. If, if the restaurant is known for the buffet, I'm going to get the buffet. So I, this is why I don't particularly love music festivals. I think they're the buffet. I like, uh, uh, I like going yeah, to see yeah. the show that I wanted to see, not the special of the day or the buffet. I guess is what I'm saying. So uh, that's my preference. It's also why I don't like greatest hits. That's my. Pre- I don't like greatest hits records. It's a buffet. 
I have no context for mm. where this stuff came from or what the movie. Like unless the, the band, as as Joseph was saying, unless the band is a greatest hits band, I'm not going to listen to any Queen yeah, records. Exactly, but I will listen to the best of Queen. Sure, Steve Miller or the best of BTO. Sure, Steve Miller maybe falls or, in that category. Or Steve Mil yeah. Steve Miller's best of yeah. Steve Miller's best of Eagles of. Uh, no, don't talk about the Eagles of, on the show. Uh, status quo. Yeah. I'd rather listen to a best of status quo, best of status quo. Amazing. I just don't. Status quo records. Not I so. don't feel the same about it. I want to know. I think uh, when an artist makes a record in a time and place, it is reflective of the time and place. And that's the context. If it says uh, this record was recorded on April uh, 5th, 1968. I think, oh, my God, Martin Luther King was assassinated the day before. What the hell was going on in their heads and their hearts? When that happened, you know what I'm saying? Like, I like to know all that stuff. Uh, uh, I I tend to agree. I, yeah. I like that. Yeah, too. but when someone... And it, well, I find it disturbing, actually, when, like, a lot of Rolling Stone rec Stones, the yeah, Stones. The Stones, I'm stuff. familiar with them, yeah. I just yeah, I just they, wrote a glowing review of their Live at the El Macombo release. Oh, that's cool. Because, see, <laughs> now that's a, all recorded on one day. But a lot of their records are, like, piecemeal mm -hmm. records that are kind of not of a moment right they don't capture a moment and that always weirded me out actually well it's true i mean uh, in the well but in the 60s you know that's a bit different right people would make a record in a day i mean until they realized they didn't have to like why are we doing this why do we have to do everything in a day uh right but what you're saying with the stones like like there would be a whole hodgepodge of different sessions yeah, i think something left off of the last record would go on the next record sure. and it's a continuous project which, which, and that's fine but i i do like when records are they don't have to be made within a day but the, all the songs from that record were made with the intention of being on one record i will also that's like i will with say a cohesion that way that's my preference yeah I, mm -hmm. I mean i understand that there are plenty of records that i must love that i am not you know and they are made in that sort of I was just oh, talking absolutely. to someone, uh, uh, it was Alex Edkins actually, about his new uh, Weird Nightmare record, Alex from Metz. And uh, there's a song in there called Lusitania, and it sounds to me anyway a lot like The Kids Are All Right. So that started a Who discussion. And I realized that as a child at the Kmart or the Wolko or the Zellers, whatever it was, I bought a Who Greatest Hits tape, which is probably my introduction to the Who. Do you know that one? With the, it's like the someone's wearing like a Union Jack uh, shirt coat or shirt yeah. yeah yeah it's like a close-up of it yeah anyway i had that and that i love that thing i will say that yeah. like there are instances where as an entry point as a child that was my entry point and they're mm. they made a great they made a bunch of great choices curatorially to make that great assist thing but at some yeah. point I, I began to reject it but joseph you're a buffet guy so you like no. well you no, like no. you like party Please. mix i'm and, i'm and, not discerning oh sorry that's the wrong <laughs> obviously <laughs> yeah I set myself up for that one. What I'm trying to say is, like, I will sometimes want the specific thing, but then other times, I want I want it all. You know, like I, I'll go for a buffet, but then I'll also go for a really nice meal. I remember you saying to me in 2008 mm -hmm. that the happiest you have ever been, or ever will be, <laughs> or what makes you happy is a large bowl of smart food. Correct. Oh, popcorn! The popcorn. Yep. A bowl of smart food in your arms, and you're on the couch, and you're watching National Treasure. Yeah, that with was Nicolas Cage. That was a really big. There uh, is yeah, th comfort for me. There's no more monotonous snack food than smart food. Like there's no you dynamic. Can't stop. Well. But there's no dynamic, and I don't know how to explain it. Like if I got a thing a, a plain. But ships, if you're after dynamics, you should go for party mix. No. No, this there's got to be some. There's got to be something to it. I think there's got to be like a spice, like every Dorito. Not to plug a company, let's put it in an artisanal way. I feel like every each and every Dorito in my bag <laughs> has okay, a, go on. has a spice dynamic. So you have one, and then you have a little sip of like Ribena and spritzy water or something. You know, I'm just telling you how I live. And then you, okay. oh, the palate, oh, I love it. And then every Dorito, like, oh, what's, oh, this is going to be good. But it's the same, yeah. but it's different. But I feel like smart food is like, there's nothing. It's just that mushy white cheese. And it's, ah, I don't know. I, like, I used to like it too. Also, they named it brilliantly. Oh, this is healthy. It's smart food. Yeah. Oh, this That's can't be I bad for me, you know? I had to stop eventually because. Wait, of wait a minute. The calories. It's not good for you? 
No, each bag has 1,200 calories. But it's not smart for you? No, it's not smart No, it doesn't you. impact your intellect in any way. It, it actually... I'm just going to... Before we move on, though, Vish, I'm going to have to Why do you, why do you think we're moving about, on? First of all, why listen, do you think we're moving on? There's no difference in the... With each bite of a Dorito, yeah, I know, I was, it's the same fucking yeah, dust. That was, uh, I don't agree. Ketchup chips, for example. My son, Louis, mm -hmm. likes ketchup flavored chips and so when if i'm giving him a bowl of ketchup flavored chips and i'll make a little small bowl for myself and then i i make a small bowl anyway and then i've noticed that there's like oh you'll notice yeah. in the bowl there's like oh i can see there's one there that's going to be really good yes and then you work towards that yeah. really good one so there's kind of like <laughs> yeah one is either you know dimensions of yeah there, there, there's different coatings uh coating yeah. levels so then yeah. you're like it's and, and, an adventure, but the the party mix to me is is just I don't know it's a lazy person's uh, root whoa, root whoa. to variety. <clears throat> Whatever, man. I'm just saying. <laughs> I'm just saying. A lazy person's root to variety. <laughs> That's pretty good. That is good. It's a good take. They should blur. It is. It's a hot take. They should put like yeah. a you know how they put those stickers on vinyl with the blurb that should be on the bag of yeah. every party mix. I think it should be on our record. <laughs> Yeah, that's true. <laughs> that's, yeah, like, There's a whole bunch of different things in there. Yeah. A lazy person's route to variety yeah. with your quote would be fantastic. Yeah, and then just be like, why keep shopping? Just here you go. Feel free. <laughs> Feel free to use it. I mean, that's fine. Know thyself. <laughs> that's I want to go back to something you said there, though, uh, many moments ago about uh, your offer to jam with Dan Behar. Oh, with Dan yeah. Behar, because I thought that was interesting because. Colloquially, a musician, when they say, uh, let's jam, I think for some people, they assume that means like we have, we'll just riff on whatever is going on. But to, to jam means to play together mm -hmm. in any capacity. Yeah. So I understood why you were undercutting, like Dan doesn't jam, but Dan will certainly play with people. That's really what you were getting at, right? I think it's more of like where my head was at at the time and the way that I understood making music with people or like forming a relationship and I had just come out of jazz school and to me the way that you kind of would form a relationship with somebody is by like getting into a room and playing together and jamming on tunes but then after being in Destroyer and making albums with them that's just not really how he operates at all. So the idea, like knowing Dan now, the, it's funny to me, the idea of being like, let's get together and jam because like, that's just never really what happens. Like usually Dan will write demos on GarageBand or whatever, and then they get sent to the band and it gets fleshed out in the studio. But like, that's just so far from the process. Huh. So that's why I'm saying it's like, oh, it's silly that I asked him to do that because it's just completely the opposite of how he operates. And I think that's sort of exemplified in the fact that he was like, uh, that's okay. Just bring your saxophone. I'm making a record. And then that's what became kaput. But there was certainly no jamming. So he trusts you and you have to trust. I mean, you, you get the, how far uh, away in your experience and speak generally, obviously, how far mm -hmm. away is Dan's demo from what ends up on the record though, after the band has all had their say? Really far. I remember, when he sent the demos for Poison Season, I was at a point in my life where I was also like writing music or whatever, and I would be so precious about demos, and I'd give so many caveats that were so rooted in insecurity and this is going to change, and this sounds like this because it was just you know young, insecure, whatever. And I remember when Dan sent the demos for Poison Season, I remember thinking, "Wow, these sound." fucking terrible like like basic ass garage band drum loops dan playing a garage band keyboard like it was really truly just like a vehicle for him to write lyrics and a chord progression but i was very like shocked at how bad they sounded mm -hmm. and then i saw what they became and it also gave me new respect i guess for dan just to be like he knew what those songs were going to become and he didn't feel the need to have to like gussy them up or give excuses he was just like here's a very rough sketch of something yeah. we're gonna make this good and i trust that you guys will do this and yeah it was definitely like a learning moment i think he's someone who cares a lot but doesn't care yeah or like i think he has a lot of faith in what 
the end result will be because he surrounds himself with people who can help realize that vision and yeah. his vision is also very solid, but then he trusts, trusts the process. Yeah. He yeah. Trusts he trusts process. and the moment. He trusts the moment. I think a lot more than, uh, maybe, uh, it sounds like I know his, he's talked to uh, when he's been on the show, talked about how he works with John Collins who mm-hmm. primarily makes the music and then they have this back and forth. But yeah, I, and you know, he's on your record. So I think it's germane to ask these questions. Andre, how did it come to be that, uh, uh, Dan appears on this Fresh Pepper record, and also, how did it work? Did he write his lyrics? Because it's a very lovely arrangement where he's singing, and then you come in uh, with some yeah, other people it was later. That how- song, yeah, he's on a song called Seahorse Tranquilizer, and it's that was the first thing that we recorded as a band. Oh, uh, was it really? That was the first chord progressions that we recorded i had brought in some chord like these chords and i was like well i'm just gonna let's just play them for a while each of each section and then we'll see if we can just cut a song together based on these chord progressions if we can just combine them in ways and try them in different feels and anyway that was the first thing we did that was the first day first thing we did okay just to kind of warm up and then especially with the help of kieran who plays drums uh, in Fresh Pepper, he really helped cut that together and create this sort of piece, this structure mm-hmm. that could be a song. And then I came up with the title, and then we were saying, well, on this song, since it's already s- something that we're building together, let's see if we can invite other people to sing on it. And we, we asked a couple of people. <laughs> and Dan was the only one who enthusiastically got back to us and wanted to do it. So it was Dan. Okay. Mm-hmm. And then we just asked him to sing where he wanted to in the end. At first we gave him a section. Maybe Joseph can. Well, I think that. also too, like by the time we sent it to him, it was sort of far enough into the process that we understood what the concept of the record was going to be. That's so true. Yes. we sent it to him and basically said, you know, we'd like you to be a waiter in a restaurant. And the, lyrics you write are supposed to or like they can be whatever you want ultimately but we want you to it's almost like reflect your inner dialogue totally and the idea initially was because there was going to be more singers it would be like almost like a a movie where the camera pans to each different waiter and then you get to hear their internal monologue Mm. but sung Mm -hmm. and when dan recorded yeah that's he recorded it at home so he was in vancouver and we were here in toronto and so he just sent what what he had and he wrote and recorded whatever he wanted and then i i sort of had a chorus and then to kind of there was like a still a section that needed some singing and so i wrote to that which sort of i think what i wrote in the end kind of galvanizes the song as being more specifically about working i uh i neglected to uh grab the lyric uh, sheet uh, and put it in front of me. So forgive me for this paraphrase, but is is one of the lines we harvest insane flowers? Is that right? We harvest insane roses. 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 Sorry, we harvest insane roses. Thank you. That is, is an. What is that? Go ahead. Oh, it's just a beautiful line. It's amazing. I love and it. And who came up with that? Well, that's his. He wrote yeah. that, and then so off of that, I wrote the "Every table gets a rose, every table gets a candle" part. What is he mm-hmm. referencing there as a waiter? The, the notion of the, the, the setting of the table, the table setting, what does that even mean? I think he was not, <laughs> I don't think he was thinking too hard about it. Yeah. I think he's just expressing sort of like the, in his lyrics about that is just like this loss of some type of relationship and maybe in it, the sadness of that, there's like the confines of working when you're dealing with something emotional yeah and and having to continue to work. And so... I don't know. There's just a sadness to it, and I felt like anything sad reflects the condition of working, of like having to, of employment. And yes, absolutely. Uh, and before we delve into that, and I think that'll lead us into where Fresh Peppers, uh, this the concept or conceit of this project and this record ca- comes from. Um, Joe, you you might have a different perspective on this, but Dan is interested in the insane insanity it comes up a lot um, mm-hmm. in conversation uh, conversations I've had uh, something about 
and I don't, it's not in an, in an insensitive way, you know, the way we talk about such things now is like, Shanna, should you be using these terms? I think he just <laughs> thinks that some things are legitimately insane. So to describe mm. something as a rose as insane, I know where he's coming from, I think, just having followed his work. But uh, what is your take on that? Like, why does he, <laughs> in terms of his writing, because you have to live with his vocals, I'm sure, as you come up with the music. Why mm. do you think he's so drawn to that notion of the surreal the bizarre, the insane? It's a good question. Um, I don't know. Dan's funny, you know? He just, he likes to joke around and he's, you know. <laughs> I've heard he, him. He, sorry, I just, I just like, I. he uses the term in conversation insane. Oh, yeah. All, all the time. As, but as, it doesn't mean <laughs> insane, it means like it's it's when he's like really enjoying something. I don't know mm -hmm. what it means in the context of the song necessarily, but like oh that's insane or something like it, it's he's laughing usually and so it's just I think he's somehow melded that word into a different to an emotion that is positive. Yeah, like way. I but I also think like what he's saying in that line and what he's often saying is like it is super strange that we do this. Like it is super strange that we are obsessed yeah. with roses sure. or flowers. Yeah, like, it, just it's just, like it's, it's yeah. a, I feel every time he invokes such a phrase, it's a commentary on human behavior generally, if that makes mm -hmm. sense. Like it is so weird. We do these, like, why is this a custom that you go to a restaurant and every day there are fresh flowers? Like, why is that? If you go to the right restaurant, I'm not, you know what I mean? Sure. I I'm think not, he's, well, he's a, he's a poet and he uh, writes poetically anyway. And, uh, and I think to be a poet or an artist or is to experience life in a psychedelic sort of way, or as it's an ex and when I, I don't know if you spend a lot of time on psychedelic drugs and myself, you, you're yeah yourself, but you see you experience things in a in in a manner that feels insane, or you recognize the insanity of mundanity, and and I think he can recognize it and he enjoys it and uses it in his writing. I, I think you both know that I am very square. I don't indulge in anything uh, that alters my mind because I have control issues. Okay. I don't want to be out of control. I don't want to be out of control. Fair enough. I creative think that's what it, Well, it's also uh, creative control. I also think... <laughs> that's a good tie-in. I also think uh, I like to be present in the moment, so I, I don't know what it is. I, uh, but I, I, I don't... I see where you're coming from and I can see Dan losing himself to such... Things. Right. Oh well, I, I think I would also say just one thing is that I often don't even try to understand it on any sort of deeper level. Is like, I like the line for the line, like the line we harvest insane roses, whether or not like it makes me feel a certain way because it's such a it's poetic in its way, and I almost detach from meaning if that makes sense. Where I just like the way it makes me feel because it evokes like a visual image or a feeling in me but i yeah i don't i, I, I often don't don't dis dissect his lyrics too much i think uh that's very valid and point joseph and i think that uh feelings are meaning mm. one of the reasons i'm dwelling on it is because it's not simply that the line is said once it's repeated mm -hmm. there's a mono and and it's bolstered by backup vocals like a lot of thought has gone into how that line is rendered. Mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. when I think about the, there's also a line, Andre, I'm going to attribute it to you. Again, I'm going to paraphrase. Can you actually sharpen the knife? I sharpen the knife. And then what's the next part? To dull it again. To dull it again. That to me is beautiful. Like that's a beautiful little uh, time capsule of the monotony of work. Mm -hmm. It's uh, got the beginning, well. middle, that and the end. It's a story. <laughs> well, it's a that is, story. Uh, that's from, that's from the very funny, uh, song new ways of chopping onions uh, yeah. or to me it's to me it's funny that's a that's a funny title and and to your point joseph about dan i will say that i process his lyrics as though the whole thing is kind of comedy so when i process comedy generally i mean some of it is very provocative or thought provoking i should say and makes me think differently or alters my perspective on life sometimes i look to comedians for that kind of stuff on some level not to put pressure on you comedians you can do whatever you want make me <laughs> laugh but I do view comedians as having, when they're when they're good, having this like astute view of the world that I'm like, oh yeah, why don't we do that? 
you know, that's a lot of comedy. The comedians I grew up with were like, isn't it insane to use a Dan word that we do this, that we behave this way, that we've accepted that this is the way we live? Isn't mm -hmm. it insane? So I think of Dan's lyrics when I really pour over them as being comedy. And so I, I think, take them seriously, but I'm also like, that's just funny. Uh -huh. and, and there are parts of this record that make me laugh, even though, as my wife said today, it's interesting. Like, it's hard for me. It was, I, was, I was reciting that line about the knife to her today, actually, over breakfast, Andre. And she's like, huh, I missed that because the music is so slow. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And I, I missed the, I, I didn't like, it's been, sorry, I should contextualize this as I often do and say to my guests. And so I just, to, just to be consistent, your record has been playing in my house a lot and my family hears it. So they all have thoughts about it. By the way, my, the alarm clock sound, why? That's what my children are like. Why? Do you want to know, know the answer? Yes. It's, and it has narrative purpose. It leads into the the next song which is about waking up and being yes i i appreciated that and i appreciate you saying that but they every time you know oh, a kid right. just every time they're like what the hell and and you know my son is like i have that alarm clock it's the same oh, sound i'm like yeah pretty yeah. universal sound anyway where was i going with this she my know. wife was like oh that's a that's an interesting line but i didn't catch it because it's so even tempered she thought that the record that well, it, that's also I'll, it's Felicity and Robin singing it, and I feel like you can, yeah, like they come in and it just, you can focus in on what they're saying, but also the timbre of their voices yes. is so beautiful that like it often becomes texture as well, which I really mm -hmm. love. Like sometimes I want to focus in and other times I want to just feel it. And yeah, I, I think that's also why she might have missed it is like it can become just sort of rhythmic texture in the background. Yes, and there it seems to be... Go ahead. It does, and it also represents the, again, the emotion of, of work, mm -hmm. where there's a mundanity, mun, yeah, it's yeah. mundane, and you repeat actions and they become meaningless, and yeah. and you can drift outside of yourself while doing them, and so th it kind of reflects that sort of. It's a very interesting perspective on restaurant work in particular because those of us who go, uh, to restaurants, uh, still uh maybe don't even recognize all of that stuff the monotony the prep uh all these things uh, andre mm. why did this concept uh appeal to both of you restaurant work restaurant workers these kinds of tasks uh, I, well okay well i think it was because um there was a couple maybe that song had been written already and then joseph maybe was asking me what the song was about and then i was saying well it's, it's about being you know a prep cook or the feeling of working in a restaurant and then as we discussed that then we it, we hit upon a concept for the record and and it was important to us maybe to have a concept for the record once it was presented to us as a way of communicating like if we both understood the record in the same way then we could both work towards achieving a goal so then we were like, well, that could be what this record is about. And we were excited about it because we were familiar with that on an emotional level. Or, and also, both of us have worked in restaurants at some point. And what kind of restaurants did you work in? Joseph, where did you work at restaurants? When I was, I was much younger. So it was my final year of high school. I worked as a server at a country club. And then I switched to being a waiter and a dishwasher at a inn in, a Bel in Bell Fountain. And then when I got to the city... I was busking for the summer for my job, but then I decided to get a real job at Margaritas on Baldwin Street, and I was oh, wow. fired promptly for missing my shifts for playing gigs. Hmm. So I, I think I only worked like four shifts before they fired me. Hmm. I hated this it. This is embarrassing. I'm just drawing back to my own uh, food service work. I had the fast food job in high school. Uh, they told me I didn't care enough about the food. <laughs> 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 that's great i love it that, that was a it was a weird criteria like, which just restaurant weird criticism uh it was the big one with the arches oh uh, they said King. i didn't love care it. enough <laughs> yeah yeah they have the arches there for your feet uh uh and then but the last i think the last job i had was at a fish and chips place in guelph i was really struggling to find work and i worked one shift and i didn't return they didn't say anything but i accidentally dropped tongs in the deep fryer 
It's all gone. And didn't tell anyone. Oh, well, maybe I did. But you need the tongs to get the tongs out. Yeah. So that, I, it was problem. very bad. Boiling hot oil. I just am, you know how some things you forget until someone brings it up. I had totally forgotten this story, but I did do that. I'm pretty sure that's what I dropped. I, I dropped something in the deep fryer. I'm like, that's it. I suck. I suck at this. I shouldn't be here. Didn't yeah. even get paid for that. I didn't even go back to get the pay. I was just like, you know what? I didn't say anything. I just stopped coming. It was yeah. really bad. Fair I hope enough. my son doesn't. My children don't hear what a slacker their <laughs> their father is. It's hard work. It's hard work, and yeah. you like to do yeah. work that you're already good at, <laughs> like <Yes>. uh, basketball. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I need a little bit of a background. Yeah. So, uh, okay. So, so what do you? Th- what what kinds of concepts came up as you pondered exploring this realm, uh, Andre? Like lyrically, what else uh, sort of came to mind beyond the monotony and the, well, the interactions with customers and things like that? There was just well, there's the one about <laughs> chopping onions, and then there's one about a prep cook in the weeds which is the title of it so there's just being just kind of being in the weeds and then also there's another one about being a waiter and doing drugs to stay awake and to do your job and how those jo- those drugs make you tired and then you need more the next shift the cycle of it's the circle of life they i think so some of this is based on your own experiences some of it is what anecdotal storytelling or narrative sure it's yeah it's imagining yeah yeah because i think like andre would write lyrics for songs and then a narrative started to form and then like even the instrumental songs that we did yeah you were sort of like written with that narrative in mind do you know what I mean and one of them wasn't even but then Andre was like oh that sounds like the sounds in it feel like a dish pit like it feels like the way it's swirling it feels like steam coming up yeah it sounded so wet (laughs) (laughs) it's like oh it reminds me of when I worked in the dish doing dishes and busing at a restaurant on college street called utopia dish are you talking about dish pit the song dish pit i yeah. was like yeah well, that reminds yeah. me of what it feels like to open one of those machines and get a big waft of steam so and, uh, it all kind of just yeah so we just made it made it work but you also reference uh maybe it's in the the onion song do you reference the platter song smoke gets in your eyes is that smoke what you're doing gets in your eyes. yep I do. Well, in that song, because, all right, if you want to know that, I was thinking the way, what I was thinking when I was writing about it is that onions make you cry. And there's always, when you're cutting onions or chopping onions, and uh, and but it's not real tears. It's not an emotional tear. And so I'm just referencing other ways of crying in that song uh, that, that are not emotional. Right. But what occurred to me is, uh, the other thing we don't think about sometimes, I think, with people in certain work situations is, they are forced to endure music True. that they may not like. <laughs> like, you know, there's just either that someone puts on the radio or someone has a playlist these days and it just plays. And so you then develop maybe if it's, if you're going to work and that song keeps coming up, you develop this sense memory of yeah. that. Like that's like I used to work midnight shifts at that gas station that made me a bit pudgy. Yeah. And uh, in high school, but yeah, no, no, I'm, I'm kidding. I'm just saying that's, that's what we used to call it. But anyway, they had actually, they said at some point the owner uh, installed one of those tape carousels, uh, Mm -hmm. cassette carousels. And you could just, you could buy your tapes if you were driving and stuff. And they, but they had good stuff. I got the Jonathan Richmond record there and a great kinks record there tape rather. And, uh, but I also brought in tapes and I would work midnight shift. So I have like, uh, I associate the REM album Monster right. and other REM records and other things that I would just in my disoriented state like there's something right. about that like when you're tired <laughs> and like when you're exhausted in a work environment I, it's hard for me to push play on any of those records without being brought immediately back to the labor uh-huh, that right. I associate with it so when I heard that reference I wasn't sure if uh, to that that the, the song that the platters made famous it's an old old song but um yeah i couldn't no. help it i couldn't help but think that like oh like that's the song that just kept playing yeah, when i great. was working in the restaurant does that make sense uh it absolutely makes sense it's it was not my intention but i i'd like that that's great uh i remember i worked at an ice cream parlor called dutch dreams and they you worked ex- at dutch dreams yeah 
Whoa. With Maddie Dog and Max. Really? Max worked there only one shift. It doesn't matter. But it they only they exclusively played like Bombaleo. Bombaleo. <laughs> what is the Gypsy King? G- Gypsy it was Kings. Like, all summer. Gypsy Kings. Yeah. Gypsy Kings. And now whenever I hear it, it's like, oh, it's ice cream time, I guess. Exactly. <laughs> jo- Joseph, do you have something like that? Do you have a song that takes you back to maybe uh, pleasant or unpleasant? Well, let's mm. let's go with unpleasant. Uh work uh work environment you worked in a country club were they blasting horrible music no it was always like weddings i mean there was lots of bad music blasted but i'm not sure if i have that specific song recognition thing i'm trying to think of other like no i'm gonna have to get back to you on you that must one. have you played in wedding bands oh yes well i was a type of sir that's that so service so the song Superstition by Stevie Wonder, which is by all accounts a phenomenal song, I cannot enjoy it. And like my son, who's four, loves it. Like he's on a real Stevie Wonder kick. And it's like, I I can't. Like it makes me feel like being on stage at a shitty wedding playing through a shitty PA for people who don't give a fuck. And I'm just waiting to get out of there. That's and labor that's- though. You're associating the song yeah. with labor. So I have the same 100%. thing. I pl- I played in a wedding band for like 15, 16 years. It started out as like a side thing like because I was in real bands. But mm. then the real band stopped and that was all we had and it kept you playing. And also, I will say, I don't know if you, I know I appreciate what you're saying about that particular song. I have found, I found rather, playing in those cover bands taught me how to play differently because it was all trying to emulate someone else's idea. Oh, yeah. Which, which sucked. On the one hand, I found, like I would always bristle when the real bands i was in wanted to do cover songs i'm like that's a waste of our time like we could be writing a song why are we learning this song but then in the wedding band i would have to play like a beyonce program drum beat on the real drums and I'm like fuck like the coordination involved in trying to do that just wasn't my instinct like if if i were in a room with beyonce i would not have gone for that i would have played whatever i would have played so it actually brought in why you're not in a room with Beyonce. i know it's, it's very <laughs> rare for me to be in a room with beyonce but i'm just saying yeah. it did alter learning those other people's songs i mean sorry this isn't that groundbreaking this is how most of us start right when we pick up an instrument your first breakthrough I mean, is oh i figured out how to play come as you are and by that's the first song i remember vaguely knowing how to play on guitar and it was mm-hmm. like oh okay i can oh i copied it i can I could probably do stuff, you know, like so. But mm-hmm. as an adult, and when it becomes a, a job to learn thirty cover songs, you're like, "Fuck!" Mm-hmm. Like there are songs yeah, no, I can't listen to the same way because I spent so many hours trying to learn them and work that I associate it with the work. So that's what I'm getting at. I just to bring this full circle. Does that make yeah. sense? Yeah, no, I'm with you. Yeah, I mean, I've played in a million cover bands, and even like for more the things that were supposed to be fun like um there was a party that andre would sing at that i did with a friend oh, right. uh, called loving in the name of yeah yeah of which course was just a big you know cover party and it's like i would dread learning those songs every month but learning how to like dial in those synth sounds and those parts like i pretty like no question was it pivotal for my yeah. musical development yeah but it is, I think there's also the thing, like I'm being forced to do something that is I otherwise associate with fun and creativity. But I think that, I mean, to talk about doing jobs that you don't like, and especially ones I think that are like, I mean, working in a kitchen, but also playing in cover bands is like, I think unless you are the rare type of person who somehow lucks into a profession, I mean, even with music, which I did luck into, and I think I knew from a young age that I wanted to do it. Like those gigs that just break you and beat you down and grind you down, and you get so bummed out and you dread them. Like, I think you need it. Like, it's yeah. so important yeah. to experience that mm-hmm. and then get so sick that you need to, like, do your own thing that has more meaning for you. And, like, you know, I worked on cruise ships, I worked in wedding bands, I worked in big bands. And, I mean, yeah, I kind of look back on them with this weird, fucked up nostalgia, like mm-hmm. thinking, like I'm grateful to them because they made me so acutely aware of how much I hated them <laughs> that I knew that I had to pivot in some way. But yeah, those those restaurant gigs and dropping gigs are pretty important in their own fucked up way. Well, Andre, like that's the other side of it for me too. Like the one thing about enduring something difficult 
or looking back on work you've done that was hard or arduous is you can it's true you kind of look back and laugh a little bit at it like you can look back at it with some degree of humor to be like again right. to quote Behar isn't it insane that I did that like just chopped <laughs> there, well, a million onions like that's insane on some there's level. that yeah there's the looking back and it's becomes humorous or it becomes a part of your story but then also my my wife also worked in restaurants more than even more than I did in her 20s or early 20s and she and I have often said that we don't that you can trust people who have worked in restaurants to be able to do certain things like there's a, mm -hmm. or also going out to restaurants with friends that never worked in restaurants they behave badly with servers they don't yeah. recognize and they, they're rude to servers and yeah. stuff and they don't understand this fundamental kindness between hum humanity that when someone is serving you you don't get to treat them badly because yes, just because exactly. their job yeah and so anyone who's come up in restaurants they all know how to behave and they have and decorum to, and yeah they have a moral compass exactly yeah yeah there's a morality that you learn through that hard yeah. work uh for each other for your fellow human and that maybe some people don't learn if they only work jobs that where they don't have to do any service. yeah no so, and i i think that humanity comes through you are humanizing labor on these songs like i don't mean to make this a a master's thesis in, <laughs> you know, yeah, but, but I think it's there. Well, I, I, don't, I hope it is, but I, I, and also because it's only in reflection, like, so for me, uh, reflecting on the fugue of writing the record in a sense, which, you know, I wasn't consciously saying, well, we need a song that does this and we need this. Yeah. We just wrote within the parameters of understanding that the record was a little bit about, the, you know, that industry. And uh, and then I can reflect on it later and I can see the, at least how I feel emotionally about it and the sort of the what's there emotionally. That's no, no, it does. It's a very emotional record on that in that regard too. It's it, it and like I say, it's it's uh, emotionally dynamic, and that it makes me laugh. It makes me think. Yeah. It makes me cry because I was cutting onions, <laughs> onions at one point. The other, the other, the other thing about just to flip it is actually some uh, positive thing. I guess Joseph was talking about some positive elements of working as well, but uh, is the camaraderie of a team. Yes. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh, and. That was reflected in working on the record in the camaraderie of the band and how everyone works together. It's a lot like a kitchen, I would imagine. Yes. You're trying to make yeah. something and everyone has a role and everyone's role is important and you come together and you achieve something. And sometimes it's arduous. Luckily, this record was not in any way. It was really fun and really easy and everyone was you know the people who play on this record i have so much respect for their abilities they're they're amazing and they're all songwriters in their own right and they mm -hmm. all know how to make a song and we all just and but no one fought everyone kind of agreed up every step of the way and worked together and i thought it was really great and it reminded me of a really well work well oiled kitchen like a yeah kitchen that no well. i can see that too the uh band name and record name fresh pepper I'm just curious about the origins of that, and I'm going to go to Joseph in a second, but uh, I will tell you, I associated it with an SNL sketch, Fresh Pepper. Oh, really? Absolutely. What is, but I don't know. Do you know that? Do you, is that uh, well, first of all, tell me, I want to hear what the, I didn't mean to spoil anything, but... Uh, no, that's not a spoiler at all. We I have no idea what that skit is. No, yeah. but no, it was just a, why did you come up with that name? I, I feel think, like Andre did. I think I just said it as a joke, and I was like, we'll change it will definitely change this name because <laughs> yeah. it's a terrible name. I thought it was horrible, but then everyone else thought it was so funny and it did, it works because yeah. like the sound of the music, a lot of it is kind of showy jazz funk. Like, yeah, I don't know. It has a fresh pepper quality. It actually fit. And then eventually we were like, okay, I guess it's just fresh pepper. It's a, yeah, it's it's like a the, spicy name. Yeah. 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 It's a joke that just stayed around long enough to actually kind of work its way into being what the band actually is yeah i feel like i'm about to ruin your lives by explaining the sketch to you do it do it here's the uh, outline of the sketch and i believe it was primarily an adam sandler led uh initiative but basically it's a restaurant it was always a restaurant scene and adam sandler often paired with some head head waiter played a 
person who might have been from Italian descent. He spoke in a silly Adam Sandler voice. And the whole joke was he would come up to people and go, a fresh a pepper. Oh, that's fresh a pepper. And then he just do it over and over and over again. He would play one of his, you know, and in retrospect now, he would play these uh, mentally diminished characters who just said silly things in silly voices. Yeah. And I'm sorry for ruining. That doesn't ruin it. That no. enhances it. And okay, good. Big Sandler fan over really here. Pap- okay, good. It. The Sandman can have its... I invoked the Sandman with another artist recently, and they're like, no, 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 I have a no Adam Sandler lyric illusion policy. Really? And I was like, okay. Well, he was just making a joke, but like, because okay. he was actually alluding to something from the film Carrie, they're all going to laugh at you, but I associate that a little bit with that Adam Sandler sketch from his record. Yeah, yeah. I do remember anyway. that one. I'm familiar yeah, with anyways. that one. You just, well, just, I mean... And to kind of bring it full circle with the Sandler thing, um, I love Adam Sandler. You should. Uh, we're going to release some outtakes, uh, kind of down the road as the album cycle goes on. And Andre wrote a song called um, "So Hot, Want to Touch the Heine. That's <laughs> really great. All right, I'm going to strike this from the record. I don't think this is true, but uh, <laughs> no, I appreciate that. Listen, yeah. uh, it's a fantastic record. Uh, Andre, where can people go to learn more about this band and this record, uh, Fresh Pepper? I think... Our Instagram account? Yeah, my Instagram account, which is my name and ish. And then uh, Joseph's Instagram account, which is you didn't You didn't make Fresh Pepper platforms? No. 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 Okay. Uh, do you think we should? Uh, no. I don't think so. I don't think it so. It depends. Do you, do you see... Joseph, do you see a future... For this project, I know you like collaborating yeah. together, but do you think there is more? Are there more fresh pepper stories to tell? Big time. Actually, yeah. after we finish here, me and Tom Gill recently scored a documentary, and I retained all the rights to the songs. And as we were recording for this doc, we thought a lot of these songs would work great for Andre to sing over. So we're going to sit down and play them for Andre, and oh. hopefully, kind of start some ideas there and Andre has been writing like I think I've it was written, so easy and fun where everyone's very excited to kind of get back into it yeah I've already written a bunch of songs that that I oh, see nice. as p- potentially fresh pepper songs but I don't think we're going to do another record about the restaurant industry. yeah no no that was a one off I think okay so there'll be another fresh pepper release at some point but you won't uh, I think you should create your own platforms then oh. if this is going to continue if it was a one off I'd say yeah you're fine I'm just giving you some advice. Maybe we'll do it. Before anyone else gets it. We'll, we'll give someone else the job of running that yeah. Instagram account. By, by the way, Joseph, is this documentary that you scored, is that going to be on uh, ESPN? Oh, don't even. The shitstorm <laughs> that caused Vish, I can't even tell you. What are you talking about? I'm sorry. I just wanted to make a joke. What? Andre, are you familiar with this story? No. When I was last on Vish's podcast, I scored a documentary that was that I was told in the initial email was going to come out on ESPN and HBO. So I had said that it was coming out on HBO, but I didn't. Okay. (laughs) I basically preempted the press release of this documentary with the wrong information. And it was about a wrestler and there's all these wrestling fanatics. And one of them listened to Vince's show or Vince's Vince's show. And then Vince, (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Vince and then uh, there was a wo- there was a woman who had a crush on me in university and sh- every time she saw me she'd be like hey Vince I'm like still wrong <laughs> I don't know how what's going on but anyway. anyway they posted on a reddit forum that then exploded because this wrestler is so popular but then it got back to the producers who basically said you fucked up our press release and you gave the wrong network information and it was just like it was very I got in a lot of trouble. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to open up a wound there, but it was, no, it was the funny. funniest part. Well, the, the fun, there's two funny Joseph parts of this. that kind of thing all the time. <laughs> yeah. Well, the, fun, the funny... The, 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 I know other stories the fun, similar to that. Yeah. The funniest parts to me were... It might have been HBO, but I thought it was ESPN in my head. because no, ESPN what, is the what funniest it part, actually was on. Well, the, no... Actually, it was on TSN. Oh, that's right. <laughs> so it went It went from two of the biggest American networks. I'm pretty sure you said ESPN, and I was like, oh, that's really cool, and that makes sense. Yeah. Sports Network Wrestling. But then when it, the information came out, I'm like, TSN, no offense to TSN on one level, but that's a much smaller it was... scale than ESPN. So yeah. then I was like, that's funny. And then the second thing I'll say is one of the most popular episodes of all time is Joseph and I talking about whatever solo record 
it was, I think. That must must have been what we were talking about. But it blew up because of the wrestling thing, because the wrestling people are fanatics. Yeah, he's and a huge wrestler. It's, the wrestler is the wrestler who has like wrestler. Kenny Omega is massive. Yeah, yeah. I have never Don't heard even, of Kenny Omega. Well, mm. we shouldn't even be talking about it because they're gonna they're gonna like go through the metadata and find out we talked about it. This is gonna blow up. Yeah. Anyway, sorry. I just thought the TSN ESPN part was what made me laugh, and I shared that with our I mutual friend Mike. I thought it was on. Mike. I think I thought the band CSN was going to. Yeah, that's right. Crosby, Stills, and Nash were going to distribute it. That's right. That's exactly right. Anyway, okay, so people Big can find mistake. out about Fresh... Don't work with those guys. Here we go. <laughs> I've heard that from Uncle Neil. Anyway, so... Uh, okay, so people can learn more about Fresh Pepper on your socials. I'll link to all that stuff. Is there a label involved? I can't remember. Yes, there is. it's on Telephone Explosion. That's right. Just one of those premier... Uh, the very best. Punk rock label. They're great. I just wanted to give them uh, some love uh, towards the end. If we can go out on a song. Oh, sorry. Beyond that, tour plans? Are you going to play? We're trying. We're trying. <laughs> We're, trying. Right. We're really okay. trying to get just this. leave it there. All, those, all the members of the band are super busy in other yeah. bands. They're all... Yeah. They are working musicians, so it's not easy to okay. find okay. a but so that we're all we'll in the keep same city. A, We'll keep an eye out on all the respective uh, socials and mm-hmm. websites to keep track of that. Maybe that'll get announced. Um, mm-hmm. If there's a song from the record that we can go out on, uh, I wonder if we've, uh, we can, by consensus, choose one. Again, I'm going to go to one of you to pick. The other one will have veto power, if necessary. Uh, I love asking Joseph to make any decision because hilarity ensues. Joseph... No, if, I love you, Joseph, and I respect you immensely. But Thank I you, like. I, oh, he's a producer. He is. He makes decisions. I, okay, so what song, Joseph? If you could pick a song, what would you choose? My personal favorite, although it, I really love "Kanji Around Me" because it makes me very emotional every time. I think it's beautiful. Another very. Uh, I don't mean this in any uh, negative way. A repetitive, meditative mm-hmm. rendering of the of the lyric. Uh, and, and the more I hear it, the more I'm just like, I'm having a psychedelic experience because I'm go. so hypnotized by what's go. going on. You don't uh, need drugs to get high. <laughs> exactly. I just need this song and I need some kanji because that's a delicious porridge thing as well. I enjoy that as well. Uh, Andre, do you want to veto or are you okay with that? No, I wouldn't veto it. It's uh, That's a great song and I'd be happy for people at home to hear it. Okay. All right, well, let's go out on that. This is from the uh, self-titled album by Fresh Pepper. Just, this is Kanji Around Me. And uh, Andre, Joseph, thank you so much for being back on the show. In this form, It was. I hope you had fun. I had some fun. I had like... We had I, fun. I had, had a little bit fun. of fun. Yeah. I had this much fun. We had that much. This much fun. Thank you so much for being on the show, and best of luck with everything in the future. Thank you, Thanks, Vish. Vish. Thanks for having us on. <laughs> Mushrooms in the frying pan Throw another onion in I'll see you when I see you Oh, I know
Uh, thank you once again to Andre and Joseph from Fresh Pepper for appearing on this, the 693rd episode of Creative Control, which is part of the Entertainment One Podcast Network, and it's available wherever you get your podcasts. If you can't find an episode you're looking for, or if you want to learn more about me and sign up for my monthly newsletter, please visit my website, vishkana.com. You can also like Creative Control on Facebook if you wish. You can follow the show on Twitter, at vishcreative. Or you can follow me directly on uh, Twitter or on Instagram at Vishkana. Also, please visit patreon.com slash creative control. Make a flexible monthly donation to keep this podcast going. All of the major and consistent income for all of this podcast work comes from the Patreon. So anyone of you out there who supports this show on Patreon, thank you so much. It means the world. And really, that's it. That's the revenue. That's what I get. All the... All the podcast platforms, they just take the stuff and they put it up for free, but they don't pay us. They just, uh, unless you're, you know, some jackass, then they'll pay you. But if you're not, if you're just like a normal person and you're not a conspiracy theory guy or whatever, then they don't pay you. They don't pay you anything. They just say, oh, thanks for the stuff. And we'll put it out there for you. Anyway, I'm, I'm quasi ranting. Six dollars or more a month grants you access to exclusive content. Uh, audio content usually derived from these fresh interviews that I've been doing or I dig into my audio archive and I find stuff there and I put it up on the Patreon so $6 or more grants you access to some exclusive content and if you're interested in receiving a Creative Control t-shirt please message me on Patreon and I will get you one while supplies last I owe two people t-shirts I'm looking at them right now I just gotta get to the post office sorry sometimes I get behind on stuff patreon.com slash creative control for more info about how to get clothing from me in a delayed fashion. Thanks again to the fine Alberta record retailer Blackbird Music, which you can learn more about at blackbird.ca. Also thanks to Pizza Trocadero, The Bookshelf, and Planet Bean Coffee in Guelph, Ontario, and Granddad's Donuts in Hamilton, Ontario for their in-kind support for this show. Thanks as always to my friend Jim Guthrie for letting me use some music of his on the show. You can learn more about Jim at jimguthrie.org. And finally, thank you so much for listening to this episode with uh, with Andre and Joseph. I hope you'll check out this Fresh Pepper record. It's great. They're fun, uh, s- clever people, as you could uh, tell, I hope, from that, uh, that episode. And uh, thanks again for uh, subscribing or f- to the show or following this podcast. And 
and telling all your friends about how much you like it that's really what gets the word out is, is people like you spreading the word in a grassroots way and that's it I want to thank you very much for listening I will talk to you very soon I hope you're well bye for now <laughs>